Okay, so uh, um, this is the top of the lab class. I've actually used the old way of loading in the data because of that slight bug in GPI if you're on Unix. Um, that it won't uh, save the data in the right place. We need to fix that. Um, so this is the old way of uh, downloading the data, which should work on all machines as long as you've got right access to the directory you're in. But it's the same data as yesterday. Um, so I'll just run through the first few commands. So pylab in line, the magic command to get the plots in line. Um, downloading the data. Ah, it doesn't work for me because I don't have internet access. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to... Uh, So, so don't, you don't need to do what I'm doing. Uh, let me just save this into a different file. Uh, make a copy. Um, so what was I doing? I was here, wasn't I? And, um, so I'm just going to have to do this because... Uh, I don't have internet access and I don't want to mess with it because I'm connected into the recording thing so hopefully you guys have internet access ah. to getting the data in for me. Hopefully that works. So. So I think that's hopefully worked for me. Yep, so there's the data. Um, now, I want you to skip through some of the top section. You should look at it later, but for the moment, the lesson I want you to look at is a little bit below this. But initially it's going to talk about the prior distribution and how we're sampling vectors from uh, independent density. In other words, we're assuming that each um, uh, weight is sampled from independently from a univariate Gaussian. Um, and then I think it sets up... Um, some prediction data points, 100 prediction data points between 1890 and 2016. Um, and then we build the basis. So what we're trying to do here is sample, well, set up the, pri the parameters of the model. So alpha is equal to 4. That's the variance of the prior distribution over W. Can people see this, or do I need to make it a bit larger? I'll go a bit larger. Let's try. Let's try zooming in one more. Okay, so alpha is giving us the variance over the prior for the parameters. The model order is the order of the polynomial, the degree of the polynomial we're going to use, and sigma squared is the variance we're going to uh, add to the data, the noise variance. So on these lines here, I'm putting down 100 prediction points, and that's where I'm going to sort of sample the data. So building the basis set is done in the same way we did yesterday. We've got some bases, which I've initialized as a matrix of zeros, um, and also a prediction basis as well. Now we're going to use, what I want you to ignore is the scaling distri Gaussian distributed variables. That's just for reviewing the material we've looked at um, earlier today. But the bit I want you to get onto is further down. So, 
down here what I'm doing is I'm sampling I'm setting k a length of vector to be equal to the model order plus one because of course the polynomial is starting at zero and I now I'm sampling from a normal of size k now instead of setting the scale directly inside the normal which I could do I'm now uh, scaling that by the square root of alpha which comes to the same thing this causes the uh, the uh, sample variance to be alpha and now I'm printing the sample so this is our W that we've sampled from the prior right so in our world of we're going to generate functions in the ABC view of the world that we just saw earlier that I've got a method of generating functions and I'm going to see if they fit my data this is how we're going to generate our function we first get a W and then I'm just going to multiply the W by the basis. So I call the basis phi pred because it's the basis as computed across the entire line. So I'm going to do that. And oh my goodness, that's ugly, isn't it? So here's the plot of that. I've taken one sample and there's the result. It's going from 1 times 10 to the 16 well, minus 1.9 times 10 to the 16 to minus 2.6 times 10 to the 16. Horrible thing. So this is this issue of these polynomial basis. So it's scaling everything up. So for very large values of 2,000, we've got an order 5 basis, so it's 2,000 to the power of 5. And we're sampling from a Gaussian density, which says variance alpha for that value, just as it says variance alpha for the linear and the mean part. So in other words, it's a prior that says something really dumb. It says that the order x to the 5 component is just as important in terms of the weighting as the order 0 component. So we'll actually we talked a bit about one way of fixing this. There's a few different things you can do yesterday, but one of the things that was suggested was to rescale the data, and that's what this next bit does. So it takes the data, it looks at the range of data x, and it computes a minimum value and a maximum value and it basically moves all these x's and these x preds to be between um, uh, minus one and one. Okay? So I've done that and now I'm recomputing the basis based on that and now we'll sample again. Now you get something much more reasonable, yeah? So within the regime minus 1 to 1 polynomials are quite nicely behaved because I mean they still aren't great to be honest and someone did talk about earlier about normalizing in the phi space rather than x um, which I thought was an interesting idea and certainly could be explored so that's one sample from our model this is taking our prior and combining it with our basis but getting rid of that stupid assumption which caused this idiotic function now that's a really important lesson. If you're building a probabilistic model, always sample from your prior. Because it's maybe not immediately obvious that something like this is going to happen. And when you fit a polynomial, normally, people don't immediately think, oh, this is a dumb thing to do because of the basis. But if you sample from your prior, you can see it's a bad thing to do. And then you can say, maybe I have to consider doing something else. In this case, mapping the data to minus one to one. Okay, so the next bit actually gives us 10 samples from that. Okay, so there's 10 samples that are all created in the same way. They uh, have a sample from W, which is scaled to variance given by alpha, and then that's multiplied by the basis matrix, which we saw before. Um, now, the next bit, which is in the notes, so this is more like notes for you to take away and uh, help with understanding the lecture is about computing the posterior. So this is just um, uh, reviewing some of the material you've seen in the lectures. So don't worry about that for the moment. That's just like uh, notes for you guys to have. Um, so what we can do though is down here we're actually computing the posterior covariance. So above this in the notes, I mean this is what I love about IPython notebook here is the covariance. Really, I should compute the covariance right underneath that because 
This is the mass that computes that covariance, and this is the mass that computes um, the mean. So I've called the covariance W cov and the mean W mean, and what you can see is it's just 1 over sigma squared times the inner product of x, x, or phi, phi, phi transpose, times 1 over alpha times the identity matrix. Um, and then the mean is the covariance times 1 over sigma times phi transpose y, just as we computed, yeah? So I'm going to get it to compute that. And now we're going to sample from the posterior. So that's one sample from the posterior. So we didn't really do this in the slides. We just looked at the marginal variance, right? But here it's one sample from the posterior. So I'm looking at the posterior density, and I'm taking a sample, multivariate normal, with the mean given by W mean and the covariance given by W covariance. And now I'm just multi making F sample equal to phi times W sample, where W is a sample from the posterior. And if you do that and plot the data alongside, you see it fits the data. Of course, I can do that again, and I get a slightly different fit of the data, because, unfortunately, it's hard to see it moving, but what I can do is just do several. So in the next one, it's, it just does several plots, yeah? So if you do several, you see that you get different samples. These are all different independent samples from the posterior. In that mechanism we talked about earlier of taking my prior and now combining it with the data through the likelihood and throwing away that samples don't fit. These are some of the samples that remain. So I want to, uh, the next bit again I think is more notes bit so that you can, you can ignore the notes where you can, for the moment, in the lab. Um, and then the piece that follows, so the, the next bit sort of talks about how you compute the mean and the variance of these samples, which is something we didn't go through in detail. But this is the result, but the mean prediction should just be equal to phi times W mean. And then slightly, um, so we can plot that mean. And there's the average of the, of the mean prediction over all under, underneath the posterior. So the, the bit of stuff I skipped through here is just the math that shows you what that mean and covariance should be in rather a long-winded way. So that gives me the mean. Um, I'm going to skip for the moment through the error. And then the next bit here is how to compute error bars. So the error bars are a little bit more complicated. Um, the overall covariance of the posterior prediction is given by, it turns out, you, you should know why this is, you should be able to derive this yourselves now, phi pred times the posterior covariance times phi transpose. Um, and the error bars I want to plot are the diagonal of that covariance, the marginal error bars. So this bit of code is just doing that and giving the ability to plot with error bars. Okay? So this bit up here, so why is it phi pred? This is the joint covariance, and this because you know the rules of multivariate Gaussians, there's a load of convolved mass to get this out of the top, but you don't even need that convolved mass if you know the rules of multivariate Gaussians, because you know that what we're saying is that F is equal to phi times W. W is drawn from a Gaussian with mean mu W covariance sigma W. It immediately follows that F is drawn from a Gaussian with mean phi mu W and covariance phi sigma W sigma W uh, sigma transpose. That's just the multivariate Gaussian rules. So the mean was being computed above phi times mu, and here we're actually doing the full computation of the covariance. You don't need to do that. There's a cheaper way. You can see if you can work out what that cheaper way is. Um, but what we're doing here is, just to be clear about the process, is we're taking the full covariance, which is a very large structured object, and then we're throwing away everything but the diagonal. The diagonal gives us the marginal covariance, yeah? The covariance at each point. So the variance of each data. And then we're taking the square root of that. And then we're plotting. 
at the mean plus two standard deviations, the mean minus two standard deviations. And then that's the result. Yeah? Are people clear about that? Any questions on that? Because I'm just going to leave you to go through and play with that code. As I say, don't spend too much time reading the sort of notes part. I've sort of integrated this with some notes for you. Don't spend too much time reading this stuff. That's for reading offline later. But just try and get through down to the um, point at which you're plotting the posterior like this. And you could even, once you've done that, go back, change the model order, do it again. See what happens. Change the noise. Change the alpha prior over the coefficients. Okay? Questions? Is everyone up and running with their uh, IPython notebooks? Good. Okay. So what we'll do, I think, is we'll give you half an hour. Half an hour to do that. Does that sound good? Yeah. Half an hour to play with that. So try and go through as quickly as possible, but understanding the code to get to this point. And then I'd really like you to go back and go all the way to the top and say, well, it's all about the prior, right? It's all about these parameters we put in. Bayesian inference is a mechanical process once I've set three things. Alpha, the variance, the prior variance on the um, coefficients. The order of the model, I've chosen a polynomial basis. And the noise. We're not learning any of those things here. And of course, then we have this later issue about effectively changing the basis by rescaling x. So that's a choice of basis. All of these things, they're just changing the nature of our marginal likelihood. Yeah? And what I want you to do with now is, in effect, sit there and play with those things and see how it affects the predictions. Data plus model equals prediction. We've got the data. Now you're playing with the model. And you've got, like, four things to play with. And have a look at what it does with the prediction. Okay? On you go.